Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Water Around the World, Local Problems, Global Solutions. I'm so excited to welcome you all to this new event series, wherever in the world you're joining us from, uh, that is programmed by Current, Chicago's Water Innovation Hub. And today, our sponsoring partner, uh, an inaugural partner for this brand new event series is the Consulate General of Denmark and the Trade Council. So we're really thrilled to have new friends from Denmark and an exciting lineup of Danish innovators here to share their thoughts on a topic that's important here in Chicago, but also truly critical for us to get a handle on all around the world. And that's intelligent carbon management and energy use in water and wastewater. So just with no further ado, I'd like to go ahead and kick this program off. George, next slide. A few logistics. Uh, if you've never joined a current event before, we love to have Q&A. Uh, we know we have a very informed and engaged audience that joins on and you've all great, got terrific questions. So make sure you submit those in the Q&A tab. And if you have any general comments, you can go ahead and use the chat. This event is also being recorded. So this recording link will be shared as always on Current's event page in our YouTube channel, and we'll send it out to all the attendees post-event. I would highly encourage you, if you've not checked it out, to go ahead and subscribe to Current's YouTube channel. You can see all of our past events from the Third Coast Water, uh, Third Coast Water Seminars or our uh, Innovator Showcase Series. There's terrific content on that uh, archived YouTube channel. So go ahead and check that out. Next. Great, here's a quick lineup of our agenda today. Um, so I'll do a very brief intro of why we are so excited to be launching this brand new series. And then I'm thrilled to have uh, Current's founding board chair, Steve Close, uh, partner at our Chicago-based venture capital firm, True North Venture Partners, here to do our overview of our problem statement. We always like to couch uh, our innovative solutions in the broader challenge and sort of the stakes of why we're trying to solve them. And Steve uh, is gonna do that for us today. And then we're gonna have four exciting presentations from leading Danish water innovators, uh, all focused on this topic of intelligent carbon management. And then we'll try to dedicate some time for Q&A at the end, but we'll also weave questions in throughout. So make sure you're sending your questions and not saving them because we'll try to uh, weave those in for each one of our innovators. And we'll wrap us up right, right on time at 11 o'clock. Great, so why are we here in the first place? I'm really excited for this event because Chicago as a, or current as a Chicago-based innovation hub, uh, this is the first time we're doing an event with our Danish partners. But in general, current's focus is making Chicago and the Midwest into the center of a thriving blue economy. And that has always been about exchange and trade. And like so many of the other areas where Chicago excels, it's our positioning as a global city with strong connections to the world's global economy that gives us our position of power and strength and it's our center at the, those networks of problem solving. So since Current was founded in 2016, we've always built global collaborations. It is, our work is so much about growing companies here in Chicago for sure, but it's also about bringing the best ideas from Israel, from Canada, our neighbors here in the Great Lakes and Wisconsin and Ohio, and quite simply, all the water challenges that we're trying to solve are global and they are shared, even if the solutions that we are working to deploy have to be deeply grounded in local context. George, next slide. Great, so some of the common problems that we face here in Chicago as a Chicago-based innovation hub, more healthy water to drink, less flood water in our basements. These are the common drivers. This is why everyone comes to the table. It's why we have so many people here in the room today coming to listen to these events. These are issues that come to ground in our homes, in our communities. And while things like water scarcity that are affecting so much of the world aren't necessarily the things that are top of mind here in the Midwest, where it's sort of the super abundance of water, especially right now in the middle of this uh, extreme melt event that we've got going on. Those are some of the critical issues. But all of these issues are linked and tied and having a network of solutions that come from around the world are absolutely critical for us as we all work to solve these problems together. Next slide. So current exists because we know these partnerships are absolutely critical and necessary and we just can't do this alone. I wanna drive home the point that Water problem solving, you know, while it continues to come out of your tap, if you're if you're fortunate, and you know, we all have you know these functioning wastewater systems that are so important, there are problems on our doorstep that need to be solved, and they need to be solved faster than we are currently. That's going to require collaboration. It takes partnerships, not only uh, among and between 
companies like those that we're featuring today, but with governments, with nonprofits that are trying to drive forward, you know, smart policy and smart regulation that helps to drive and create the conditions for thriving markets here. We need to figure out how to all help de-risk these solutions and bring them to market faster. And that is why Current exists to bring these multi-sector partnerships and, and multi-place partnerships like what we're going to be featuring today. Next, George. To accomplish our mission, Current needs to do two things really well. One, we need to help Chicago homegrown water innovators find markets all over the world. And we do that in a variety of ways. And we know that we can be building solutions here that aren't just going to be deployed in our backyards, in our Chicago River that you see here. We're building solutions that are getting deployed all around the world, helping solve water scarcity, thinking about smarter desalination, all sorts of things get built here that we deploy elsewhere. So that's thing number one. Thing number two is what we're here to talk about today, and that's bringing the best ideas from wherever they are in the world here at home to Chicago to deploy them to help solve Chicagoans' problems. And that's what we're here to learn about today from one of the leading countries that has been on the vanguard of the environmental and climate movement for decades now. That's Denmark. If you've ever been there and seen or heard about some of the incredible climate work that they're doing, uh, you know, this is one of the best places that we can learn, and we frankly want to leapfrog and shortcut and learn from what they're doing and bring those solutions to ground right here in Chicago. So with no further ado, I want to turn it over to Jens Inevoldsen, our senior technical advisor right here in Chicago at the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And he is going to share a little bit more context about uh, what's so exciting about the Danish Chicago collaboration opportunity here. Jens? What an intro. Thank you very much, Alenia. Uh, yeah. The Water Technology Alliance is about, uh, it's a governmental uh, technology providers and water professional joint venture. Uh, and uh, my name is Jens Enevoldsen. I work out of the Consulate General of Denmark in Chicago, a long experience uh, within the Danish water sector, both as a operational, but also as a general manager. Um, I'm here uh, as a utility, wastewater utility person to talk about uh, wastewater, knowledge share about wastewater. <clears throat> And uh, doing this across the pond is, is uh, pretty exciting for me. Uh, I think we can learn something from each other. So uh, true partnerships with the uh, associations like Current, we, we knowledge share. Um, we are sponsoring this event today to uh, create focus on, uh, on a few topics that really have moved the Danish wastewater sector. I don't think you will see rocket science today, but uh, it is easy to install, easy to adapt, or also without actually doing anything to your existing, existing structures. Sorry about that. So um, if any of you are interested in, uh, in talking more about optimization, resource recovery, or will be interested just in a walk and talk on your wastewater facility, reach out to us afterwards. You can uh, just uh, click on your camera on your phone, uh, and then you can get our contact information via the, I can't remember what it's called now, the, uh, the blurry, blurry thing there. So follow us there. And uh, yeah, I think that's it for me, Alenia. Excellent. Thanks so much, yeah. Jens. Well, we're, we're really thrilled to be, again, kicking this off with Denmark. Uh, and just Thank we you. simply can't go it alone. We're going to build better solutions together and look forward to learning more about that. So with, I'm really excited to turn it over to Current's founding board chair, Steve Close from True North Venture Partners. Steve, if you've been in the Chicago and water and clean tech ecosystem, ever or around it, you already know and love Steve, but he and True North Venture Partners are truly a global force for forward thinking investment in the clean tech, water and energy space. Steve's been an advisor and mentor to countless water entrepreneurs, uh, not only here in Chicago, but truly around the world, working with uh, Singapore and the great companies at Imagine H2O. Uh, so Steve, I can't think of anyone better to frame up this problem for us, turning it over to you. Well, thank you very much, um, Lena. Um, so I'm I'm excited uh, for this event. And when you guys asked me to kick kick off sort of at the start, um, I thought, wow, these are some pretty great companies that we have coming on in here, and um, it's an honor to do that. So I want to say, you know, this topic is going to be on responsible carbon management. I just made me think, you know, back to my days when I was in General Electric, we talked a lot about how energy and water were linked. And it was a very fossil fuel historical legacy view to make energy, you take coal and you burn it, and then you use that to boil water, and then you have a steam turbine go. So yeah, water is needed to make energy. 
And then we'd say, well, you know, energy is needed to make water too. Well, like think of wastewater treatment, all, you know, massively energy intensive. You needed those coal plants running full bore to power the wastewater treatment plants. So yeah, the two were linked, but that's a very legacy inefficient view. And we're, we're having a different view today. We see that energy and water are absolutely linked um, think of climate change, you know, as the planet gets warmer, as we have more extreme weather events, we get, you know, more flooding or more droughts, water scarcity is going up, water management becomes all the more important. So energy and water are really linked. And what nature is telling us is that the two need to work in harmony with one another. And responsible practices means really achieving like an entitlement, like entitlement meaning like what's possible. And achieving entitlement means eliminating wastes, having things be very efficient, achieving full potential. And in wastewater treatment, that means you know, being very energy efficient, being capital efficient, flexible and adaptive. And the way these Danish companies think, it's really interesting. It got me thinking about Michelangelo. So he was asked like, how do you make these great sculptures? And how he says, well, wait a sec, in that stone, the sculpture is already complete within that marble block. He said, before I start my work, it's already there. I just have to chisel away the superfluous material. So that's how he viewed it. And I think in wastewater treatment, like the pure water is already there. When you think of wastewater treatment, think of pure water that's pristine, crystal clear, pure water is already in there. There's energy inside of there, plenty of energy to do the treatment process, plus plenty of energy that we can pull out. We can make it energy neutral, energy possible. There's nutrients inside of there that we can harvest and pull out. Think of it like Michelangelo, and that's the way these Danish companies are thinking about it. So the historical way of wastewater treatment, you just blast in tons of air, you dump in tons of, um, what, are they, what do they call it? They, they call it uh, a carbon source. That means methanol. You dump in a ton of methanol for denitrification, other chemicals, and then you, you result in a ton of biosolids that you just you know, haul off in your dump truck to the landfill. That's historical. But an idealized entitlement, so you, you, you work the system in harmony with the, the energy, the water. You think of it like Michelangelo did, all those components inside. You manage the carbon. You don't need to dump in a ton of methanol. The carbon is already there if you think about it and do it the right way. You can manage the nutrients. You can chisel away those components to leave beautiful, pure water for reuse and capture those other valuable components. So here we are today. Why Denmark? Elena talked about this. So D Denmark is incredibly advanced on the path to achieving harmonious energy water management, including in wastewater treatment. We call it wastewater treatment. It's really resource recovery. And, you know, the Danes, they're really sought after and advanced. Like, you know, reaching out to them, it's pretty much like, you know, grab a ticket, stand in line. You know, we've got a lot of people ahead of you. You know, everybody's rushing to their door. And I, I kind of kid a little bit, but it's somewhat true. The Danes are really advanced. In, in fact, they have a commitment by 2030 to achieve energy and climate neutrality in their water and wastewater sector by 2030. And many utilities are already there. So what we're going to hear about today is not like startups necessarily. This is proven technology. Denmark has a history in doing this. There's reference cases. This is happening. So current likes to view itself on the forefront. Current has got fantastic and deep capabilities and takes a sophisticated view on problems and um, how best to address them. It was really current working with the Danish government and, you know, to identify these companies that we want to bring in and share with our network. There's a lot that we can learn. We think that these practical, responsible, cost-effective solutions can achieve that entitlement, that harmonious entitlement, energy efficiency, capital efficiency, being flexible, flexible, seasonal, daily loads, temperatures, adaptive, population growth, or like very, that's what like responsible near entitlement treatment is. So today we're going to hear from four companies and some of them might um, be focused maybe on one portion of wastewater treatment. Some are, on all, but they all think holistically. They're, these are the Danish companies that are making this energy neutrality, this harmonious, this near entitlement, wastewater and recovery. They, they're the Michelangelo's and we're thrilled to have them here. So I'm jazzed about it. I'm excited and um, thanks a lot.
Thanks so much for that, Steve. And thanks for, I think, putting a really fine point on something that we, we try to talk about a lot at Current, but I think it, it doesn't always hit home. Innovation does not always mean being on the absolute bleeding edge of the science. Innovation can mean taking proven ideas, de-risking them and deploying them in a context where that is the leading edge. And that's, I think, what we're talking about here is, is bringing innovation to a new market and uh, hopefully seeing a lot of this help to accelerate this, this transition here in the Midwest and in the US. So, so I, Elena, innovation requires two things. It requires the idea and then the implementation of it to realize the benefit. That's the, and that's what these guys have done. That's right. And proven it and de-risked it. And we should take their example and build on what they've already done and everything they've already invested. So that's terrific. And to turn it over to our first, uh, Ryan Sanford is a wastewater process engineer and modeler at the DHI group. And he is gonna take us through advanced process control West modeling. Ryan, over to you. Wow, thank you guys. This is epic. Okay, so yeah, I'm, I'm Ryan, I'm with DHI where we model all sorts of water systems. That's water, wastewater, we're talking about rivers and groundwater and surface water runoff and collection systems. But today I'm talking about uh, what I do, which is wastewater treatment process modeling. And we um, we seek to model the plants that, that are looking to somehow retrofit or, or use the existing infrastructure in a better way. So from the model, we try to pull out what's the best way to operate the plant, what's the best way to control the plant, and then we are also able to then implement those uh, advanced controllers. All right, George, let's go next, and you can go ahead and play that video. So here's an example of a project that we have done recently, and real quick, we'll start the steady, I recorded this yesterday, so we'll start the steady state simulation. And you can see we're starting to grow some bugs produce some sludge, the digesters are starting to populate and the uh, effluent quality is starting to line out. We're not nitrifying yet. And then we'll get to this power cost and, and carbon footprint um, uh, kind of dashboards in a minute when we do the two scenarios. But yeah, what we're seeking to model here is a, a client was wanted to evaluate the effect of adding cloth filters to augment their primary clarifiers. And in doing that, we're discussing, I mean, they're gonna take out a lot more carbon um, from the, the feed stream and that's gonna get diverted to the digester. We're gonna make a lot more gas, but the question was more about the balance. What's gonna to happen to the rest of the plant when we're taking out all of this carbon? You know, Can we still support denitrification and that's what we're modeling here. I, I mean, I did, it uh, looks like we've started nitrification. There's this steady state's almost done. Um, but instead, we did make a model for the cloth filters, but that's that's a custom model that we made for the client. Right now I'm modeling this with a, I made this particularly effective clarifier, and then we have a bypass so that we can use that to determine in, in a simple way how much carbon we're diverting to the digester versus the, the process. And on top of that, if you look kind of in the middle on the top, there's this methanol dosing skid. So that's that's set up to operate when nitrate in that tank gets below a certain level. I think it's set to two parts per million. And that, that's just to make sure that we're fully denitrifying even in the scenarios when, um, when there may not be enough carbon from the diversion, then we can compare the results. Whew, okay, so now we're going to I've initialized the, the dynamic from that, that steady state. Now we're gonna run with no bypass, uh, 30 days of this dynamic influent file. And it's not flow equalized. And I think you'll see that in this, uh, on, on that screen in the middle there with the internal pumping and aeration rate. But what you should be able to make out is that a lot of the time in this scenario, the plan is operating energy neutral, even energy positive in the green on this uh, dial in the middle. And that that's um, due mostly to the fact that we're diverting as much carbon as possible, in this case, to the digesters. And at the same time, in that pie chart, you can probably see the carbon dosing was fairly high. This is not just nitrous oxide emissions, this is actually all practical carbon footprint calculations that we could make for this plant. And then I accidentally added a chart, sorry about that. Okay, so that's, that's one scenario. We're gonna run a second one now with 30% diversion. 
So I just open up this valve and put 30% in. It's a simple way of showing the difference. So now we'll be sending a lot less carbon to the, the digester and, and conserving some of it for the plant. Um, maybe it's not that practical to actually bypass the clarifiers, but it's, it's just our way in this case of showing the effect. Um, there's also no grit in my uh, influent file for this project. So initially you can kind of see maybe we're operating at a higher um, draw from the plant, from the grid and, and less energy neutral, less energy positive. Um, but the carbon dosing has been kind of dramatically reduced. Um, you can also see that the OPEX has remained mostly the same. The main difference here is biogas revenue, but let's, um, we'll take a look at that in a second. And the carbon footprint. Uh, I know there's a lot of lines on there, but the, the carbon footprint actually was a little bit um, higher in the in the second case. All right, last last slide, Steve or uh, George, can you please go to the next one? That was pretty quick, so I took a couple screenshots of the results that we just saw and, and just pasted them here. So for the first run where we had that high primary clarifier efficiency, basically modeling the, the case where maybe you have some enhancement in the primaries or clock filters. Um, and then the second case is the 30% bypass. So aeration rate's a bit higher on the second case because we're probably passing maybe a little bit too much COD to that, that process. Uh, the chemical cost is significantly higher in the first case because we're, we're presumably not passing enough COD to the to the denitrifiers, and and we have to pump in methanol. Uh, pumping rate should be about the same because that's internal recycle streams. The sludge production don't need to worry about too much for this this project, but uh, the main difference is the revenue from the biogas. But so these results kind of show at least in this case, that there's not really a break point. It makes sense to go ahead and, and divert as much as possible and, and go ahead and make it up with methanol. But um, but that's only the cost benefit, right? We have to look at the, the carbon benefit to doing that and the actual logistical challenges to doing it. You know, maybe you don't have a process where you actually can sell power back to the grid. So then you need some kind of um, controller to, to see that, see that we're approaching energy neutral and then maybe no longer divert um, to the digesters because there's no point in making extra power if we can't sell it or use it somehow. Um, so then start to offset some of the chemical cost. And this is also all very, because they're so close and in, in total cost in this case, um, this is very dependent on the cost of methanol and power and all of the uh, parameters that go into this, this case. So it, the, the result was a controller to decide uh, how much carbon to divert and when to do it. And, and that controller works as a, as a feed forward controller predicting the load on the plant. But okay, that's just one, one example. The, the main idea is that these things can be modeled and that we can kind of look at the carbon split throughout the plant and, and decide the best way to use it. Um, yeah, thanks guys. I, I look forward to some discussions. That was great, Ryan. Thank you so much for that. Um, just a real quick question. Um, what, where, what's your sort of ideal implementation context? Like, is there an example of a utility where you've applied this and, and what, what was the result in terms of their cost savings? Yeah, there, there was a plant recently in Denmark that we thought this was going to be um, a smart way to operate to, well, actually, sorry, I should say the opposite. It seemed like it didn't make sense to divert COD when we were already on the verge of, um, requiring some methanol to, to boost the process. But it turned out that um, it, in this case, just from the, the modeling effort we saw, actually there's a pretty significant cost savings to, to doing it this way. And that's because they were getting some green credits for uh, some of the gas that was produced. And then the cost of the carbon dosing was just minimal over the course of the year that um, we decided to go that route. And, and the result was a uh, real-time controller that's predicting the actually the ammonia load on the plant and deciding which sections we're going to aerate and that then told us how much denitrification space there was in the plant like how much capacity there was 
and we could back out from there how much carbon we needed to divert. Great, great. And you can see how many variables here in local regulatory context sort of matter for all these decisions that you might make, whether you can sell it back to the grid, right? What the sort of savings will be. Um, so great illustration. Thanks for that. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next presenter. So thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now uh, to Sophie Thorgard, who's the General Manager of U.S. Operations at Sternholm. Uh, Sophie, take it away. Thank you. And hello, everyone. My name is Sophie. And today I am going to talk about uh, the headworks with the focus on where and how to capture as much as possible of the great fresh organic carbon material that you're getting into your plant. And why do we want to do that? Well, it's a part of your carbon balance and we want to use the carbon correctly and then the most optimal way in the treatment process, we want to wash it off the screenings and the grid instead of hauling it to landfill, maybe even produce energy from it. Um, I want to draw some attention to the headworks because the headworks really sets the scene for the rest of the plant. It might seem, seem simple and less fancy than all the advanced treatment processes, but paying a little bit of attention to the headworks can really save you a lot of trouble later on. Um, and I also uh, just already now want to mention an important key number for you to hold on to. For every pound of carbon or organics you save from going to landfill, you can on average produce 50 produce 15 to 16 cubic feet of biogas. And if energy production isn't your primary focus, a significant reduction in hauling and disposal costs for sure is. Um, so pre-treatment is pretty simple, but there's a few rules you need to obey. Uh, next slide, please. So let's start at the screens where the primary purpose is to uh, remove or uh, reduce debris or larger solids and to protect the downstream equipment. I'm not going to talk about different types of screens today, um, but this is primarily applies to automatic screens with the possibility to adjust the runtime. We want to let that screening map build up to capture as much as possible by limiting the runtime if the hydraulic capacity in the challenge allows for it. You want to pay attention to the flow, a too uh, high flow through the screens uh, makes it harder to build up your screenings map and to capture the organics. And a too low flow um, will uh, let grit and, and heavier organics accumulate and cause wear on the screen. Um, next slide. But by doing that, you naturally get more screenings with a larger, uh, higher uh, organic content. So what to do with it? In, it's wet, it's loaded with fecal material, uh, it's odorous, and it can be difficult and costly to dispose of. So, of course, you want to you want to compact and wash it. Uh, you want to save the carbon and organics for downstream treatment, and uh, you want to save the hauling and disposal cost. You also get an odor-free transportation out of this. Um, a few tips for operation of your screening washer is to use hot water to control the grease buildup and longer flushing times to control the grit buildup uh, in your screening washer. Next slide. Uh, the next step is the grit removal, where the primary purpose is to remove and capture grit and grease to protect downstream equipment and avoid grit accumulation in tanks, as you see right here. Um, in order to make sure you uh, remove even the smaller particles uh, below 200 microns, the output from your grit chamber should be about 80 to 90% organics as the finer grit particles usually abound to uh, the organics. How the grit chamber is run usually uh, depends on the, uh, how the output is being handled afterwards. Um, with a grit washer, um, after your grit removal, you want to capture as much as possible. If you do not have a grit washer, you might want to carry a little bit uh, more of the organics to the primaries and digesters um, to, to produce uh, energy. Next slide. In Denmark, the most common type of grit removal is the aerated uh, grit removal. A good rule, five to eight minutes of retention time. Uh, you also want to pay attention to the right amount of air going into your uh, grit removal on the upper left uh, pictures. So there's a little bit too much air, too high velocity. You're, you're not allowing for uh, enough settling. 
um, a little uh, too little air uh, can kind of create a bio biology in your removal chamber. You do not want that. We just want settling. I think the uh, lower picture shows a, a pretty uh, well-adjusted uh, grid removal chamber. Um, next slide. Lastly, what do we do with the grit and organics? And you probably guessed it by now. We're going to wash and dewater it. Um, similar to the screenings materials, it's wet, it's loaded with facial, it's odorous and costly to dispose of. Uh, the solution is the grit washer. You want to save the organics and uh, the hauling cost. Let uh, me quickly go through this example. If you pump one ton from the grid removal chamber into a grid container, you basically also have to dispose of one ton, which will be about 75% organics, a lot of water, a tiny bit of grid. Do you pump it into a separator or classifier, you have to di dispose of about one fourth of the amount, which will still be 50% organic, 25% uh, water and 25% grid. With a grid washer, you will only have to dispose of dispose of one tenth of the amount, which will have less than 3% organic, 10% water, and the rest is clean, clean, nice grid as on the picture in the lower right corner. And final slide. Um, and I know I'm out of time. I just wanted to show you the picture of Sternholm grid washer. This is the Rolls Royce within grid washing. Um, this is our largest model with a capacity of up to 793 gallons per minute. If we add a cyclone, uh, this is the dual auger solution. It can handle up to three tons of grit per hour. Thank you. Hey, I, I have a question, Sophie. This is Steve Kliss. Um, This is really cool thinking about, you know, uh, what you talked about and, and like this washing and all that. But I'm also thinking about like the downstream from the primary when you get into the main wastewater treatment process. It kind of seems like there maybe should be some other benefits that you get from the downstream processes by having an optimized and improved primary treatment. For sure, Is that for true sure. Or... Did I cut you off, Steve? No, I said, is that is that true? Like, is that, for it sure. sort of seems intuitive like it should, yeah. Definitely, well, if you if you optimize your, your head works, you, um, I wanna focus on, on the grid in this one. You just saw the pictures as how much grit can accumulate in tanks and, and you lose volume, um, a lot of volume actually. And I don't, sometimes people are not aware and it's it's the finer grit particles that just flow through um, and, and, we, and we wanna capture that uh, with the grit washer. Are you able to remove enough, like when you go down to the 200 micron or something, are you able to almost remove some COD as well to maybe make the secondary treatment a little bit easier? or not, not at that level? That's not the purpose. We want to keep the COD. We want to wash it off the grid. So we want to capture the grid and wash it. And then we want to send the uh, COD to the uh, secondary treatment. Oh, for some of the stuff that Ryan talked about, helping to minimize the amount of methanol and that type of thing. So Exactly, yeah, cool. yes. Sorry. Um, so, so you could see how this would be actually complementary and builds from what, what uh, Ryan's sort of analytical decision support framework uh, kind of teed up for us. So that's terrific. Um, I want to keep us moving. We do, we'll get more audience questions if we have some time at the end. Uh, but let's turn it over now uh, to Soren Rasmussen, uh, the sales director over at Landia. Um, yeah. So to, to build on a little bit of you, you've heard uh, Sophie and Ryan talk about um, how it can be quite beneficial to look at how the carbon is distributed uh, within the plant with um, from the headworks with so and so much going to the digesters and so much going to the um, secondary treatment process. Um, so, so let's imagine you've done that, but, but oftentimes we come out to plants and we see the, um, the aeration basin, basins being uh, grossly over aerated and and it's a little bit painful to see because when you're over aerating there, you're really just burning off uh, a lot of carbon. And um, of course, in addition to wasting um, energy. Um, so there's some pretty uh, low tech solutions to, um, to avoiding this. Now, we understand that, that some plants, uh, you may not be able to turn down the blowers. Uh, maybe the blowers were sized for future uh, treatment capacity that the plant's not yet uh, reached. 
Um, or maybe there's a certain amount of air required to keep the solids in suspension. Um, but really, there's a lot of benefits that can be achieved by looking at this. And, um, and um, so, so one way and a fairly low tech uh, solution that a lot of the Danish plants have, have implemented is, is just turning down the blowers. And if you are um, unable to keep the solids in suspension with that, add mechanical uh, uh, mixing. Um, now, the, um, yeah, yeah, let's just skip to the no next, next uh, slide there, please. Um, so you can both, you can save both carbon and uh, energy uh, by, uh, by implementing this, this rather simple uh, step. Um, submersible mixers in your evasion tanks. Um, so if, if you've heard, as, as you've heard, the Danish plants uh, are, you know, widely energy self-sufficient. The only way to achieve this really is to look at reducing uh, energy consumption and uh, producing energy. Uh, next, please. So uh, Landy offers a wide range of, of uh, mixing solutions, uh, submersible mixers and all different sizes and, and shapes, um, digester mixers, we also have uh, mixed liquor recycle pumps and things like that. Um, hundreds of different models that we can look at for, for each specific uh, tank. Um, next slide, please. So here's just one example of um, wastewater, uh, the resource recovery facility that um, in the aeration basin, they were able to turn off a 50 horsepower aerator and then use uh, two five horsepower mixers uh, to keep the solids in suspension uh, during those hours of the day where they don't need a lot of air. Um, results in a lot of uh, uh, cost savings, of course, um, but you're also uh, saving some of the some of the carbon and there are additional process advantages to uh, to this. Now, something like this can be very uh, simple to uh, implement. In fact, these mixers can be installed without even draining the tank. So you don't have to completely upset your, uh, your treatment process. You don't have to go build new tanks or any of that. It's really a fairly, fairly simple um, uh, solution to, uh, to implement. Um, next, uh, please. Another, um, another case would be uh, the anaerobic digesters. Uh, improving the mixing in the anaerobic digesters, you know, once we've received all the lovely carbon there that um, both uh, Sophie and Ryan were talking about, you want to, of course, utilize that the best way possible. Uh, so this is um, another facility that replaced an, uh, an inferior or an inadequate mixing system with a, um, a mixing solution from Landia, our, our Landia gas mix system. So by, by getting better mixing in this digester, they were able to uh, improve the volatile solids destruction and consequently increase the biogas production. And because this plant uses the biogas beneficially, they have a combined heat and power unit that um, produces on-site uh, energy with the, with the biogas. Um, next slide, please. So uh, what we would encourage you to do is look at some of the low hanging fruit. You know, we, we, if we go to a plant and we see that the uh, dissolved oxygen level is four or five milligrams per liter, it, it, it really just shows that there is some some room for improvement. There's some low hanging fruit there. Um, and that's whether you're, you're really only nitrifying or if you have a denitrification step or there are some additional uh, issues if, you, if you're trying to achieve BioP and, and all those different things. But just a, a, a very simple uh, approach would be looking at the, um, the DO in your uh, nitrification tanks. And, uh, and if it is higher than just one or two milligrams per liter, it means there's room for improvement. And a lot of times uh, that would, can be uh, greatly improved by, by implementing some uh, mechanical mixing. Um, also keep in mind that not all solutions require multi-million dollar investments. Um, 
if you sit through some of these uh, presentations, uh, you, you, you'll see a lot of fancy technology and, and there'll be you know, membrane this and membrane that and, and some really advanced uh, processes, which are great, but it, it, you don't have to start there. Uh, a lot of times you can really just, well, look at look, what, what options are available for uh, you know, energy savings, helping pay for the cost of the equipment. Um, and like I mentioned, uh, some of these mixers can be installed even without draining a tank. So it, 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 a lot of the technical solutions can be very easily um, uh, implemented. And um, yeah, that's all I wanted to, uh, to say today. Um, so thank you. Great, thanks so much, Soren. Steve, I know you had a question. Sure, Soren, you know, the idea of, so today in the secondary basin, the way the aeration does two things, it aerates and it mixes. And I think that's your pulling out. It's like, those are combined functions from one thing. And whenever you have one thing doing two functions, that's not good, you should separate them. So you're talking about having the mixing done with a mixer and have the aeration, the purpose of that be to aerate and to optimize that. That makes absolute sense. And you can see how this would be helpful on that journey to achieve this, you know, re responsible carbon management. So is this, is this part of like a key part of the solution for Denmark and Denmark utilities in achieving this 2030 goal? Yes. And, and you're absolutely right, Steve. It's uh, so, so air is, is great for nitrifying, of course, but it is terribly inefficient for mixing. Yeah. And, and a lot of times, so whenever you're designing an aeration system, and everyone does this, you look at how much oxygen is required for the process and how much air is required for mixing. But whenever the latter is the, is the greater number, is, and that's what determines how much you're uh, running the blowers, that means you're just wasting uh, energy because it's, it is a terribly inefficient way of, of mixing or keeping solids in suspension. So but yes, keep those but that keeps those coal power plants happy because then they got some electricity to decide. <laughs> it, it sure does, it sure does. But we, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking to the people here who, who, who are looking to optimize uh, a bit and, and, uh, and so decoupling those two and looking at how much oxygen, oxygen do I actually need for the biological process and then let mechanical mixers take care of the other part of it. Uh, and, and, and yes, you're right. I mean, the, the Danish uh, wastewater plants would never have achieved energy self-sufficiency without looking at, at this and, and decoupling the, the, the two, one, the aeration and two, uh, the mixing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to get fancy and, 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 and you're further optimized, you can look at simultaneous nitrification and denitrification and, and things like that. Absolutely. Uh, but for starters, there's a lot of uh, low hanging fruit, a lot of easy steps to get just to part of the way without having to go uh, overboard uh, just uh, from day one. Yeah, real quick related question about the power savings you could see from changing out the method and equipment for digester mixing. And I think the idea was, you know, using pressurized biogas, which causes a lot, you know, it needs a lot of power to actually compress that. That's fueling a lot of digesters and the mixing that happens in digesters. So, is there other other places you see savings and what are some of the alternatives? Well, obviously throughout the plant, there are, there are tons of different places to save energy. Uh, I, today, we're only talking about the, you know, the, the, basically the carbon uh, distribution and ways to optimize that. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, yes, digester mixing is, is definitely a, a place where many plants have room for improvement. Um, but then uh, but then the other other one would be in the activated sludge process. We see that uh, there's often times a uh, big uh, room for, for improvement there. Great. All right. Well, let's go to our final presenter, uh, Mads Warming from uh, Water and Wastewater, the global head of Water and Wastewater, I'm sorry, at Danfoss. Uh, Mads, please wrap yep. us up. Yeah, thank you. And just following up on what was said, I, I think what Sean just mentioned here and the, and the questions, I think that one thing one should realize is that, that water and wastewater facilities is uh, basically from a process point of view, make crazy uh, that you have a, 
a high, high load in the morning and the evening, a super low load during nighttime, you would never run an industrial factory that way, that, that you would never do. And, and therefore also the capability to control that facility, and that's what I will talk a little bit about, how, how do you get controllability of the facility uh, is absolute key. And then we come back to what John also say, you need to split the things because else you cannot get the needed controllability you want. So next slide. Uh, super few words about uh, who is Danfoss. In fact, a, a major Danish company with 28,000 people. And uh, I think important here is that we have a factory in Rockford, just one hour outside of, uh, of uh, Chicago, uh, where we are producing uh, a lot of our wearable speed drive for the global market. So and especially, in fact, for the water business. I will not talk about uh, Barbell speed drive in, in details. Uh, I guess you all know, as you can see in the one corner there, that the, the big advantage is uh, using Barbell speed drives on blowers and on pumps that you can get a tremendous uh, lot of saving, just reducing speed with 20% uh, would, would offer you so 30, 40% saving. So uh, not deep diving too much in that. Next slide. Um, what a lot of people is not aware of uh, when we talk about our speed drive is that everybody uh, assume uh, they are equal in the energy efficiency. And again, I will not spend too much time on it, but the reality is that that is not true if you begin to look at it from an installed efficiency point of view. And that means that when you first have installed your harmonic mitigation, you have installed your air condition and all these things to get it operate you will find that choosing the right well, speed drive supplier is more important than that you are stepping up in energy efficiency on your motors. Uh, so, so there is really a difference. You just have to look at it holistic. Uh, the other thing, what is going on, um, which we recently have introduced is that wearable speed drive is turning uh, to be more than just a valve speed drive. It's turning into also being a sensor. And uh, nowadays we are able with help of our speed drive to supervise pumps in, in a lot of different ways based on edge computing, based on, on technology embedded into the drive. But let us get to the case. Uh, next slide. So uh, what uh, some of the reference which have been made today is, is reference back to a facility in, uh, in Aarhus, which in fact, as uh, four or five years ago now, uh, first time um, uh, really was up uh, a wastewater facility producing above 200%. That means 100% more energy than you need for treating the wastewater. And uh, having presented this a couple of times, I, I, I think what is, I know a little bit of what is going on probably in the head, uh, because uh, then a lot of people will think about then probably they have injected carbon from the food industry or they have uh, taken sludge from another facility or, or they have an industrial load or what do I know? And the answer to all that is no. This is household wastewater to 95% of the case. Then they probably, the Germans would say, then they have probably used windmills or solar cells. No, they haven't. So it's a old facility. It's not a new build, it's 30, 40 years old. It's a very old, very traditional activated sludge treatment plants as we see them, 80% of them around the globe. The only difference is that they have installed, besides what you have heard about, they have installed a tremendous lot of sensors, which they trust in online sensors. And they have installed a tremendous lot of wireless speed drives. That's why I like it, uh, so that they get full controllability. And, and, and that is, in fact, uh, the, the, the key trick in what they have done. And, and, and they created, created so the first place where you not only got your wastewater treatment, you got uh, and got that energy neutral, you got also additional energy enough that you can cover all the energy you need for pumping the drinking water into the city. So you make the whole cycle energy and climate neutral. And that's what Steve referred to. That's the ambition to do that on all both small and big facilities in Denmark. Uh, in, so that we in average on the whole segment in 2030 is, is, is at zero. Uh, some of the things they have done here uh, is, is, is um, of course, some of them, as on was a little bit into uh, that is uh, simultaneously nitrification, denitrification. That means that they are operating at a half PPM or 0.4 PPM DO. 
which a lot of people will scream about, but, but, but it's showing that you can do nitification, you can do the identification at the same time. If you drive your DO that low down, then the efficiency of your racing system will increase. They are uh, using uh, the reject water from, uh, from, um, from the wastewater dewatering, uh, where you have a lot of ammonium, uh, they are using Animox process to treat that. Uh, what's the benefit of that? You can do it with a lot less energy used. You will use less carbon for it. So you will have more carbon you can put back to your digester and that way produce energy. And so we can keep going. Some of the things we had in the intro here from, from uh, Ryan also uh, was that if you, take, if you take more carbon out in the primary part, then of course you get uh, more carbon for your digester and can produce more energy. And at the same time, you have a situation that you have less load on your racing lanes. That has then to be balanced with that you have enough carbon, of course, for your delectification. But it's the whole philosophy about having a lot more sensors, which you rely on, let the computer do all the control. You have a lot of our speed drive doing the things. And in that way, you can adapt your facility to exactly what, what is needed. That's the cornerstone behind it without having time to go into all the details. Next slide. Um, then usually uh, it's also, yeah, but is that then the only facility? No, that's not the only facility. They do the same in Copenhagen. They do the same in, in uh, Odens and a few other places uh, and there will come more of these. Uh, we see also the Dutch people is moving that way. Uh, so, so it's not so that it's the only one. And I showed you some figures back from 2016. There is figures from 2018. If we take the figures from 20, uh, you will see they fluctuate a little bit up and down. Sometimes they are 200%, sometimes they are 180. That's real life, uh, as you also know it. But key, if I talk to these facilities which have, um, have, have implemented this uh, way of thinking, plus what you have heard earlier here, then their statement is that 70% of all the savings or improvements they have obtained over the last, I think, five, 10 years they have worked with this is in fact coming from process control or what we some nowadays call digitalization or water 4.0, whatever you want to call it. But, but it's basically a question about doing, understanding how important it is to have sensors which can detect different things and, 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 and having the controllability. And I think nicely what both CERN said and, 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 and was saying also about avoiding to have carbon into your uh, system, which, which, which shouldn't be there. Uh, that's the key to it. So, so uh, that's, that's basically, uh, I think, the important statement that um, you can have a traditional activated slot treatment plan. It can be 30 years old. It's not a problem. If Brian go in or Ryan go in and do his right modeling, uh, it will be impossible quite often to twist them around. And I think, by the way, I forgot to say, this is also a nitifying facility. So it's, it, they are not cheating. They are operating at, at a very, uh, or very strict demand to, to outlet. And then the last thing I would say is, in fact, that, that you can see here on, on the energy saving potential, I was trying to paint how much you can gain from going from a IE2 to a IE3 motor. And I think it's a good idea, don't get me wrong. If choosing the right VSD supplier will in fact offer you more, traditional viable speed control, which I started with, will offer you so typical 20, 30%. If you now begin to look holistic, at savings at the whole wastewater facility, then you begin to seek 40, 50. If you then begin to look it together with energy production, then it is that you see these improvement over 100%. So, so I, I think it's super important to understand uh, how much you in fact can do on traditional activated slot speeding plan that without having to, to, that you need a budget of $100 million, uh, 5 million will do a lot uh, to a traditional facility. Yeah, I think that was the last slide prior to switch. Thanks, Mads. That was terrific. And I think it really underscores the point that while it would be great to have a regulatory environment, perhaps that helps to sort of drive some of these advances, we can deploy them right now. And there's real OPEX and other savings to be had, even in traditional plants, even, you know, absent sort of the forward 
looking environment that exists in Denmark. And I think that's really important. Maybe I should add to it that, that uh, the average uh, return on investment uh, have been uh, five years uh, on some of the process optimization they have done down on three years. Uh, some believe electricity prices is high in Denmark, but they are not, not when we talk industrial. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm sure that will apply also a lot of places in US that you'll be able to get, get down on, on these type of return on investment. So it's not just trying to be green, it's in fact good business also. Great. So I want to wrap with one question to all of you if you if you care to comment on this, but because utilities are sort of your major kind of market and audience here, um, <clears throat> what one thing would you want to make sure that US utilities who are listening to this presentation would like need to know before they you know reach out and, and bring this to market and bring this to ground? on their site. Yeah, as I, as I, if, if I should start out, uh, then uh, I think one of the super key thing is you need to have the operator and the people on board. So, so this is not just about technology. As I, right. I think we can present the technology. We, we know how to do it. We are super happy, of course, to transfer the know-how. But, but, but where you really can see, or you know, sometimes see, I'm traveling a lot around the globe, see a lot of different things and very advanced things. And, and, and where, where you see they have not obtained what they should obtain. And, and, and the reason is not because they have not invested what they should. The reason is simply that if the operator is not fully on board and understand why this is important to do it that and that way, you will never ever get there. So, so the top management need to say this is another KPI or another goal we want to be, we want to be energy neutral, you need to get the people on board. Uh, and then I think what CERN also said a little bit is uh, maybe take the low hanging fruit. There's nobody who, who have said you have to go from where you are now and then the full way to produce 100% more energy than you need. Uh, you could take it in step. Um, but, but, but getting the people on board, I think, is super, super important. Yeah, really helpful. Others, key messages for utility potential purchasers? Uh I, th I think I would uh, join Mess and say that it's, it's really, really a mindset change that you need to uh, to do, and it it is baby steps. You 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 do not do it uh, overnight. Baby steps, baby steps, baby steps. It mindset, and then I think uh, another advantage that most of us haven't covered today is that when you start to lose your um, all your mechanic equipment, less you also get less maintenance. So. Um, it's actually just a benefit all the way uh, through the plant and, and also for the personnel going there, with the, the maintenance guys and uh, yeah. Yeah, that's also, very helpful, baby steps, but the pathway points to something that more and more city leaders, you know, mayors are, are needing to do, which is show a path to, you know, yeah. a better kind of cleaner energy future. And I think it's not always the most obvious place people look. So it's great to see that. Those, that and and as Mess says, that there's a lot of operational cost to save there. And, and uh, you can sort of uh, turn them over to CAPEX in the future. So uh, maybe you can use more on your energy, on your sewer system or whatever. But there's a lot of operational cost to save to turn over to CAPEX in the future. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Final word, anyone? I'll just, I'll just, just agree that, that, that this uh, transition has happened over a long period of time in Denmark and, and you don't have to start there. Just, <laughs> there are a lot of easy solutions readily available and just you know contact us. We've, we've been through that, that <laughs> learning uh, process. Contact us. We'll take a look at your plant and see if there are some you know easy, easy solutions that are readily available. Uh, you don't have to go out and, and build a new plant and spend a billion dollars to uh, uh, you know get at least part of the way. So um, we, we look forward to, to speaking with you. Great. All right. Well, I think we are out of time and this has been really terrific. Uh, George, if you want to wrap it up, I want to give you guys a quick preview of some of the upcoming events that Kurt has on the uh, calendar. So our next Third Coast Water Seminar is coming right up on March 31st. It's gonna be a terrific, I'm sure, talk from Dr. Manny Teodoro from University of Wisconsin-Madison. And it specifically speaks to uh, trust in American institutions, specifically uh, drinking water and the rise of bottled water. So really interesting talk on sort of the political economy of, of drinking water that uh, we, if those of you have not participated in this Third Coast Water Seminar series is really uh, a terrific way to feature both 
all of our local institutions that are doing such terrific research at the cutting edge of, of water innovation, uh, but also to bring in speakers from all over. So very much in the same spirit of this Water Around the World series, uh, trying to bring the best of what's out there right here to the Midwest, right here to Chicago. And stay tuned for future uh, Third Coast Water Seminars, as well as uh, innovator showcases and in water around the world. We hope to be adding new country partners. So if you are interested in featuring uh, your market and some of the innovators in your space, please reach out to us. Uh, George Brigandi is the mastermind behind all of our, uh, of our virtual events, and he'd be happy to discuss further what those partnership opportunities look like. We are always interested in building more uh, and just thrilled to have everyone's interest here today. Uh, look forward to seeing you on a future event and let's solve water together. Thanks everybody. Take Fabulous. care.